1973, the Kung Fu craze swept America, Europe, and the world. For some, and I think we've heard this argument already a couple of times uh, this week, for some this marks a pivotal moment in the contact between Occident and Orient, decisively transforming the West's fantasies about its Asian others, some of which we've just seen. Um, the Kung Fu craze hit, of course, just as the geopolitical order was shifting. Its great icon, Bruce Lee, became the first truly global superstar, just as globalization was taking off and as cultural pluralism was starting to grow in the wake of decolonization, the civil rights movement, and feminism. So that's kind of my, my, my Bruce Lee, I suppose. Um, okay. So Lee and the Kung Fu film were famously new in particular, in providing images of Chinese and Asian masculinity that reversed orientalist stereotypes of weakness, effeminacy and subservience, or perversion and cruelty. Lee's charismatic heroism and his lithe athletic body, a powerful pole of male desire and identification, was a far cry from Fu Manchu or Charlie Chan. Its appeal in China and East Asia more broadly can be relatively easily understood as a matter of national, ethnic or racial pride. But, as his international style attests, Li and the image of Kung Fu seem to have had a powerful resonance beyond this context. Li's legacy in the West, which I'll be examining here with regard to particular questions of masculinity, necessarily involves a more complex interplay of identity and otherness. In order to further examine the fantasies that underpin the continuing interest of the Asian martial arts in Europe and America, <coughs> I'm going to be looking at some of the particular legacies of Lee and the Kung Fu craze in our contemporary media imagination. I'll be doing this through an analysis of the blind superhero Daredevil in the eponymous television series, produced by Marvel Television and ABC and distributed on Netflix across two series in 2015 and 2016. Here, Asia and the Asian martial arts are thematized through the figure of the ninja, who turns out, as the series goes on, in a number of respects, to be Daredevil's uncanny double. One thing that's been claimed of the legacy of Bruce Lee is that after him, how violence is depicted on screen profoundly changed. Aspects of Kung Fu performance and cinematography have become routine aspects of Hollywood and global action cinema. One place this is particularly evident is in the superhero genre that bloomed in the 21st century. Here, it's through the grace and power of martial arts, along with CGI technology and Hong Kong style wire work, that the convincing representation of the superhero's exceptional ability to fight, around which the genre revolts, has been made viable. The superhero genre is also significant in terms of the issue of identity and difference I've just raised around Kung Fu. Inasmuch as this is pervasively thematized within it, the otherness of the superhero often serves to allegorize forms of real-world socio-political marginality. Just think of the echoes of the American civil rights movement in the mutant human conflict in the X-Men films, the explicitly post-colonial narrative of Black Panther, or the questions around gender and power raised around Wonder Woman. Daredevil is no exception. And in this series, images of the martial arts, and especially of the ninja, are involved in negotiations of identity in relation to an imagined Far Eastern other. As evidenced by the plethora of articles on and interviews with Daredevil stunt double Charlie Brewster and the series' action director Phil Severa, both promoters somewhat as star names in themselves, its gritty and visceral depiction of martial arts was clearly conceptualized by the studio as an important part of its audience appeal. This was underlined in the extensive investment in the fight scenes, an intentional signal by the audacious 100-move, five-minute, single-take, hallway fight, fight scene at the end of episode two of the first series, in which Daredevil takes on an entire gang of Russian mobsters. The link of such action spectacles explicitly to Asia and the appearance of the figure of the ninja emerged more slowly within the series' unfolding thematics. Nonetheless, these clearly revolve from the outset around racialized identity and a geopolitical imaginary. The series is set in fictionalized contemporary New York, riven by territorial gang warfare, primarily carried out on ethnic lines, with Irish American, Russian, Chinese, and Japanese groups vying for dominance over the city's drugs trade. 
It's a somewhat paranoid image of American space under foreign threat, whose context seems to me to be the recent shifts in global economic and political power and the consequent rise of the anxieties that underpin Trump's populist nationalist campaign for presidency, which is very much contemporaneous with the release of the Daredevil series. As Daredevil wages his campaign against these gangs, the Russian and American villains are quickly supplanted by their more alien and exotic East Asian counterparts. And Daredevil's true antagonist turns out not to be the white American mob boss turned politician, Wilson Fisk, with some uncanny resemblances to Donald Trump, I think, but rather Nobu, the leader of a Yakuza gang that turns out to be a front for the hand, a cabal of occultist ninjas whose true goal is world domination through mastering the secret of eternal life and the creation of an invincible human weapon. The striking resonances here of a long history of yellow peril imagery might already alert us to the possibility that Daredevil's fantasies of the Asian martial arts are not unmitigatedly progressive. The ninja is, in many respects after all, a paradigmatic image of the threatening alien other, unseen, <coughs> lurking, hostile, deadly, often swarming, the individuality cloaked in a uniform <coughs> that hides their face. In line with stereotypes of the Asian, and in contrast to Western norms of self-interest, cinematic ninjas pursue duty without human feeling and unto death. Their arts are untrustworthy, based on deception and trickery, rather than the honest strength and fair competition typical of the white hero in Hollywood cinema. <coughs> Seen thus, Daredevil's plot follows many of the common tropes surrounding white martial arts heroes as described by Sean Tierney. Daredevil is schooled in ancient Asian arts and to establish white mastery of these is pitted against his evil Asian counterpart, against whom he must triumph to prove his supremacy and the supposed naturalness of his cultural appropriation. Though Daredevil's propensity for violence seems at first explained by his father's having been a boxer, it turns out, as the first season progresses, that in fact he was initiated into the art of fighting by stick. What's the point? Place? The blind, katana-wielding leader of another, another secret ninja group, the Chaste, whose mission it is to defeat the Hand. Daredevil's martial arts are thus Asian too, and as the series progresses, this is made increasingly clear stylistically, with the bare scrapping aesthetics of some of the early fights increasingly supplemented with the acrobatic flips and wushu spinning kicks that are the media hallmark of Kung Fu or the Ninja. In episode 7, Daredevil finally comes face to face with Nobu, both masked, uncanny mirrors of each other, but the series is first grand battle of the ninjas. It should be a gladiatorial battle of the ninjas because two guys come in, only one comes out, um, from which Daredevil emerges victorious. Such patterns might be further understood through Sylvia Chong's account of the Oriental scene. For Chong, the original Kung Fu craze in the US fits into a wide pattern of depictions of Asia in the wake of the traumatic blow to American masculinity and patriarchy dealt by the Vietnam War. After this, Asia in American popular culture became a fantasy space of obscene violence and horror. The Asian martial arts, as a figure of this, becomes something the male American subject desires in order to symbolically reign phallic mastery. However, Chung argues that rather than figures of identification, stars such as Bruce Lee offered themselves as what she calls conduits for a style of violence that can be appropriated by the white western hero or martial arts practitioner without orientalizing themselves. Reading Daredevil's Ninjas in this way, not only the legacy of Bruce Lee, but also of the Vietnam War era yellow peril anxieties, is given further credence by an archeology span of its imagery. The ninja plots of the TV series, in fact, come from a run of the comic book uh, from the early 80s, when there'd also emerged a slew of American-made ninja-themed films. Probably the earliest of these, Enter the Ninja from 1981, and with its title, of course, making the inevitable reference to Bruce Lee, played out the familiar trope where the white hero, schooled in ninjutsu, is pissed against his evil Japanese counterpart to emerge victorious. This was a time when Japan had recently emerged as the world's second largest economy, causing similar anxieties in the Western media and political discourse to China's rise today. 
However, though Cho and Tierney's arguments are persuasive, I'm not convinced that their ideas fully account for the particular fascination of Daredevil or the role of images for martial arts within this. Chong's description of the martial arts as appropriable without affecting identity doesn't account for the extent to which Daredevil not only uses ninja techniques of stealth and violence, but also models himself, resembles, and ultimately becomes a ninja. Chong's account underplays the extent to which the Euro-American fascination with martial arts involves not just appropriation, but also self-transformation through and captation by the image of the other. It seems to me that I'm faced in Daredevil with something more like a process of simultaneous intercultural identification and differentiation described by anthropologist Michael Taussig in his book Mimesis and Alterity. I'll probably pronounce that word eight different ways in my paper. <laughs> um, drawing in particular on the writings of Walter Benjamin and Roger Kaiwa, Taussig conceives Mimesis not simply as mechanical copying, but as something grounded in the powerful compulsion in former times to become and behave like something else, a kind of primal drive evident even in animal adaptations to their environment. Such a conception of mimesis marks all representation as akin to sympathetic magic, and as Taussig puts it, quote, the wonder of mimesis lies in the copy, drawing on the character and the power of the original, close quote. Representations and imitations such as that involved in Daredevil's Devil's mimicry of the ninja never leave us as subjects untouched by and in command of what we represent. We're also subject to what Kaiwak terms convulsive possession by the object of our imitation. For Taussig, the late 20th century marked a moment in which the thin borders of contact with others had come to envelop the entire cultural landscape and in which cultures are no longer relative to their own cultural context but are relative to each other. In such a condition, uh, as Tausig puts it, the West is no longer able, is no longer a stable identity against which mimetic alters can be confidently construed, opening the possibility of a novel anthropology not of the third and other worlds, but of the West itself as mirrored in the eyes and handiwork of its others, which is perhaps something that I'm trying to do here. Tausig's reiterated metaphor is of a hall of mirrors, not perhaps unlike that which Bruce Lee finds himself in, that the planets enter the dragon, in which our images and those of others are fragmented and the distinction between identity and difference begins to collapse in an ecstatic moment of mimetic excess that seems to undermine the possibility of stable identity formation per se. And I wasn't going to do this, but we could also translate that into a famous Bruce Lee quote, there is no opponent, because the word I doesn't exist. <laughs> okay. So Taussig seems primarily sanguine about these developments. They do, after all, undermine the certitudes and positions of mastery on which an old colonial order was based. With his investment in Benjamin, the flash of mimetic excess, whether encountered in documentary footage of Troprian Islanders playing their version of cricket, or in the spectacle of their devils becoming ninja, may well seem a utopian moment of openness to the other which promises to shatter the prison house of the world as it is. However, we might also need to note the relationship between Benjamin and Kaiwa's accounts of Nemesis and developing theories of paranoia in the circle to which they belonged. Daredevil, perhaps, involves a complex ambivalence to his age and others, as both a pole of paranoid attraction and paranoid fear. One way or another, as I've already suggested, the politics of Daredevil's Orientalism seem profoundly marked by this paranoia. However, this is all not yet to have accounted for another key aspect of Daredevil's mimesis of the ninja, one that helps us nuance uh, its relation to the oriental of scene. What's particularly striking in Daredevil is his physical vulnerability, a vulnerability linked to the very fact that his superpowers of enhanced sensory perception uh, emerge from disability. Daredevil is a blind superhero. Daredevil makes a stark contrast to characters such as the monstrously strong Incredible Hulk, the armoured Iron Man, or the bulletproof superhero Luke Cage. Against such images of masculine invulnerability and inviolability, what stands out throughout Daredevil 
is the spectacle of the hero's body bruised, penetrated, cut open, bleeding and suffering. So he's probably a stoic hero, I'm guessing, as well. It seems paradoxically to be in terms of such a vulnerable, disabled, mutilated and leaky male body that Daredevil hails the desires and identifications of its audience. There is, of course, a longer legacy of blind or crippled martial artists in the cinema. It reaches Daredevil in part, perhaps, via the 1989 film Blind Fury, in which Rutger Howe plays yet another white hero who, guess what, finds himself pitted against his evil Asian version and triumphs victoriously against them. Um, uh, but also beyond that, into uh, Blind Fury was itself a remake of the 19. Ooh. Sorry, that's a hat. <laughs> Of the 1967 film um, Zetoichi Challenged, so it, it, you know he's drawn from a kind of a long-running uh, character from the series throughout the 1960s, basically um, of Japanese films. Um, and Zetoichi is just the tip of an iceberg of East Asian films made during the 1960s and 1970s, which featured disabled or mutilated heroes. And Man Fung Yip, for one, has interpreted these as responses to what he calls the profound social fractures caused by the twin processes of modernisation and colonisation in the region. Handicaps come to allegorise experiences of dispossession and disempowerment with the magical skills of the blind, sick, sword and singling, signalling a desire to be healed and re-strengthened. For Chol, the figure of Kung Fu in America serves as a similar emblem of transcendence of historical trauma. And she notes the contrast between what she calls the body incontinent and Kung Fu's body mastered. Whilst the traumatised body of the Vietnam veteran film seems associated with the former, the Kung Fu body in its kind of classic sort of phase offers as an antidote a remasculinization re through discipline and self-mastery. So again, very stoic, I think. Even if the arc of the series, with Daredevil's acquisition at the end of season one, of an armoured costume is towards mastery. Daredevil's ninjified body is nonetheless primarily represented closer to the pole of incontinence. And in this, he seems to offer something different to Bruce Lee's hypertrained physique. So, just to remind us of his incontinent body. This said, reading it retroactively through Daredevil, the gashes on Lee's torso in the iconic stills from Enter the Dragon might mark Lee's body as already involved in this kind of phantasmatic incontinence as an object of desire. According to Paul Smith, Hollywood action films revolve necessarily around what he calls masculinity on trial. For Western ideals of impenetrable and inviolable masculinity to be reasserted, they must be put narratively to the test. In this much, the hero must pass through and overcome a temptation of masochism. Smith suggests, however, that this process is far from seamless, leaving what becomes a hysterical residue that problematizes the ideal masculine body. What perhaps marks out some representations with regard to others is the extent to which they tarry with this hysterical side, this hysterical state, rather than rushing on to its resolution. Through his brush with the obscene violence that American culture so often associates with Asia and Asian martial arts, Daredevil is a figure who remains suspended in this position of hysteria. And it's primarily, and it's primarily in such a guise that Daredevil addresses, I think, the fascination, desire, and identification of the audience. So where does that all leave us? Come to the conclusion. I hope very much that I've presented the appeal of Daredevil here as a complex phenomenon. And I suppose in a sense this particular legacy of Bruce Lee is quite a complex phenomenon. Addressed to a hegemonically male white Western subject, still in some degree of crisis, some 45 years after Bruce Lee and the Kung Fu craze hit American screens, with all their ambivalent charge of alterity. Daredevil seems to me to express both a set of paranoid desires to control and master otherness, restabilizing identity, but also a complicated identification with and desire for the other, more akin to a hysterical resistance which in many ways shatters certitudes and positions in the world. That's it.